Our castaway this week is a musician. He's a specialist in light music and in film music. Composer, arranger and conductor, Ron Goodwin. Ron, could you endure loneliness, do you think? I think so, Roy. I really do have a, a strong belief in a higher power. Mm-hmm. The creative force of the universe, if you like to put it that way. And I do feel that... Uh, I'm not alone most of the time and that uh, whatever I'm doing is what I'm supposed to be doing. Yes. So I would feel that if I was on this desert island, it must be what I'm supposed to be doing at the time and I'd have to make the most of it, really. You do have this very limited ration of music, just eight discs. Did you have any plan in choosing them? Yes, I thought I'd choose things that would uh, give me some kind of personal memory or a bit of a laugh or something like that. Well, let's have the first one. What's that? Well, I'm terribly fond of my dogs. We've got three of them. And my own personal dog is a thoroughbred mongrel, direct descendant from Battersea Dogs Home. (laughs) And since I understand that I can't take a dog with me... No. Well, I'd like to have the record of the singing dogs just to remind me of the dogs at home. And what would you like them to sing? Well, what would be better than patter-cake, (laughs) patter-cake? Singing dogs, believe it or not. (laughs) Ron, where were you born? Uh, In Plymouth. Your father, a member, I believe, of the Devon Constabulary. No, not the Devon Constabulary, no. He was actually a member of the Metropolitan Police Force, the London Police. What was he doing down there? Well, in those days, there was no Ministry of Defence Police Force, so the Metropolitan Police used to do all the duties that the Ministry of Defence Police do now. I see. And he was sent with a lot of other coppers to do security duty at Devonport Dockyard. Mm-hmm. And whilst he was there, he met my mother and uh, my brother and I were born. And then when I was nine years old, I think somebody at Scotland Yard said, whatever happened to all those coppers we sent to Plymouth, send them back immediately. <laughs> so we all moved back to London. Were you a musical family? No. My brother and I were forced to take piano lessons at the age of five because everybody else did. Mm. But uh, we weren't all that particularly interested at that time. In fact, I never really got interested in music until I was 11 years old and went to a school that had a school orchestra. And then I was so fascinated with the idea of people playing and banging and scraping things together and uh, making wonderful noises that I asked if I could join the, the orchestra. Yes. And the music master, one Vernon J. Todd, said, well, if you'd like to learn to play the trumpet, you can join, because that's what we're short of, so that's what I did. (laughs) And they had one for you to play? Yes, yes, they had one that I was able to learn on, and my very first performance with the school orchestra was of the Grand March from Tannhäuser, which starts with a trumpet fanfare, and uh, my trumpet had a rotary change from B-flat to A, and I was uh, had it turned the wrong way, and I was playing a semitone out from the other two trumpets. Well, so. it made you stand <laughs> out from the others. <laughs> <laughs> you moved up to London, so another teacher had to be found. Yes, I, I continued piano lessons with a Mr Knott, I remember. We lived in uh, Kensal Rise at that time. Mm and uh, continued piano lessons with him. But uh, my real interest was in the trumpet and in writing music. I started at my secondary school, as we used to call them then, to take music as a supplementary subject for matriculation. And that uh, was really rudimentary uh, part writing, three and four part writing and uh, rudimentary harmony. And I was fascinated by that, the idea of actually being able to write things down that other people could look at and play.
You'd also started getting interested in jazz, hadn't you? Yes, we had a, a sort of offshoot from the school orchestra, of our dance band, which we called the Woodchoppers, and uh, we started to get a few gigs at church halls and things around the area, and uh, we, we all got very interested in jazz, Fats Waller and Bix Beck and all those sort of musicians. Where did the name come from? Oh, we were all Woody Herman fans, of course, oh, as well, and uh, we used his At the Woodchoppers Ball as our signature tune. Uh-huh. <laughs> Let's have your second record. <laughs> well, a musician that I very much admired in those days and tried to emulate as a trumpet player was a jazz trumpet player called Bunny Berrigan. Yeah. And uh, I used to imagine that I was Bunny Berrigan when I went out on these little gigs, as we called them, together. And I made a transcription of the record that I'd like to hear now that we could play with our band, and it was called I Can't Get Started. How many in your band? Or we had, uh, I think at that time, about five or six. I think Mr. Berrigan on on this disc has more. He had the advantage. Can't Get Started by Bunny Berrigan and his orchestra. Did you have dreams of being an orchestra leader? Not really at that time. Uh, I mean, shortly after that period, we uh, started going in for the Melody Maker Dance Band Championships, and we actually, uh, I think we came fourth in the South London one year, in 1945, I think that was. Well, that was making your mark, wasn't it? Oh, yes, yes, but uh, it was really more of a cooperative band, and, I mean, I wasn't uh, the leader in the sense that I was employing the other musicians. We were all working together to try and do something. You had no idea that you wanted to be the Geraldo or the Joe Loss or the... Oh, no, no, I mean, I, I just wanted to... To be a musician, you know, and by this time I wanted to make my living as a musician anyway. Did your parents agree with that? My mother was against it. She thought that music was all very well as a hobby, but you should have a proper job. There was a theory in the family that you should go into insurance. Well, I did go into insurance for three or four months. Well, it was uh, an insurance broker in Northwood in Middlesex. What were you doing, selling it? Uh, No, I was the junior clerk in the office Mm -hmm. and... uh, He overheard me several times on his telephone ringing the other members of the woodchoppers and saying things like, uh, you know, it's uh, St Paul's Hall this evening, uh, bring a white shirt and a red tie and your own music stand. And (laughs) one day he said to me, you're you're not satisfactory here, Goodwin. He said, my advice is to go and get a job in music because you'll never be any good for anything else. And he, of course, he was right. And I wish I could say that I went back and thanked him, but I never did. Was there much of a fuss in the family when you were not altogether voluntarily quit insurance? (laughs) No, well, I rang a friend of mine who'd been taking us out to play for the American forces on the USO engagements of those days, and uh, he worked for a music publisher, and I asked him if he could get me a job with a publisher. Doing what? Anything. I didn't mind. I just wanted to be in music. And uh, he said, well, Campbell Canelli's need a copyist. So if you'd like to go along and see a gentleman called Nat Lewin, who's their chief arranger, he'll uh, interview. And I got the job there. And I I must confess to a a certain amount of dishonesty because I pretended I was still working at the insurance company and went and worked at the music publishers for some considerable time until I felt fairly secure about being there. Then I told my mother what I was doing, and since I had a regular job and it didn't appear to be too risky, she was quite happy about it. A a word of explanation, Ron. I mean, there you were working for Campbell Connelly. What were you copying and why? Ah, well, in those days, of course, every publisher had an arranging staff. The basis was somewhat different to the way that the music business operates nowadays. I mean, the, the publisher would have certain songs that he was working on at that particular time. 
he would persuade or plug the artists to either sing them on the radio or play them with their bands or make records of them mm -hmm. and then provide the arrangements for these artists to be able to do that, you see. So there would be an arranging staff making orchestrations of his pieces and I was the lowly copyist who copied the parts from the score for the individual instruments of the orchestra. Well, lowly it may have been, but you had started in the music oh, business, yes, which yes. is where you wanted to be. Yes. So let's have your third record. Well, around this time, I'd taken a, a tremendous interest in orchestration. I was copying other people's orchestrations and trying to find out how they got certain effects. And one day I heard a piece of music, it was probably on the radio, I don't know now, but uh, it made such an impression on me because I suddenly realised the tremendous possibilities of what one could do with an orchestra. It wasn't just a question of voicing things so that people played things in block harmonies and so forth, mm. which was very much the way that things were written for the publishers. You could do all sorts of wonderful things with the individual sections of the orchestra to paint pictures and make wonderful sounds. And I found out that this piece of music was called uh, Daphnis and Chloe by Ravel. And the particular section that I heard that made this tremendous impression on me was the daybreak sequence. So I'd like to hear that now, please. Daybreak from Maurice Ravel's Daphnis and Chloe, the Montreal Symphony Orchestra, conducted by Charles Dutois. So there you were, Ron, a copyist, copying other people's arrangements. It must have given you quite an insight into how arrangers got their effects. Was anybody helping you and explaining? Yes, there was a wonderful man working at the publishers called Harry J. Stafford, who, uh, apart from being a good arranger, had a wonderful sense of humour... He rather took me under his wing and started to try to explain to me the intricacies of orchestrating music for all different sorts of orchestral combinations, and I learned a tremendous lot from him. What was the first time that you were commissioned to do an orchestration yourself? I can't remember exactly. After Having been at the publishers for some time, I answered an advertisement in one of the musical papers for a young arranger because I felt I knew enough now to branch out as an arranger myself. And uh, when I uh, went for the interview, I found that it was a company called the Paramore Gold Orchestral Service, which turned out to be Harry Gold, who also ran the Pieces of Eight, oh, which yes. is a Dixieland jazz band, and Norrie Paramore, who later, of course, became the recording manager for Columbia Records. Mm -hmm. And they were running a bureau providing orchestrations for the BBC Overseas Recorded Broadcast Service. And uh, they auditioned, well, got me to do a, a small piece of orchestration, and I suppose just to see that I knew what I was doing, really, and gave me the job. And our main task in those days was a programme called Composer's Cavalcade, which uh, went out every week for the forces overseas. And uh, it featured... Composers like uh, Ivan Novello, Noel Coward, uh, Catelby, you know, the sort of lighter mm -hmm. composers. And I found that I was making orchestrations for these programmes on a weekly basis. So I guess, apart from one or two things that I might have done whilst I was working as a copyist for other people, that, and I can't remember who they would be now, that was the first uh, real arranging and orchestrating assignments that I had. Must have been a great excitement hearing your first arrangement oh, yes. by an orchestra. Oh, yes, great thrill that was. 
after a short while, well, I, having finished with Paramore Gold, I went to work for another publisher, this time as staff arranger. Oh. I, I was a fully-fledged arranger now, which meant that I was doing orchestrations for all the BBC orchestras, and there were a lot of BBC orchestras in those yes, days. Yes, there were. The Review Orchestra, the Variety Orchestra, the BBC Dance Orchestra, and so forth. And Stanley Black uh, rather took a shine to my orchestrations and started hiring me to do uh, arrangements for programmes that he was doing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, that was a great thrill. He did a programme every week called Top Score, which was... Uh, the Top 20. Yeah, that's right. Big arrangements of the Top 20. And I used to go down to the rehearsal and hear my one played and then rush home to hear it come over on the radio. And tremendous thrill. You mentioned Harry Gold just now. At one time, you used to play trumpet with Harry Gold's Pieces of Eight. Yeah, only you? as a stand-in. His real trumpet player was called Cyril Ellis, and yes. he was a very good jazz player. But he was in the Navy at the time, waiting to be demobbed. So uh, on all the engagements that Cyril couldn't make, I was the trumpet player. But yes. basically, I was arranging in their office, you know, and that, if, that was a sort of added string, really. If Cyril's at sea, get Ron. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> right, record number four. <laughs> well, I guess I'd need to have something to laugh at on this island. There wouldn't be a lot to laugh at just standing there on my own. And one of my funniest memories of uh, working in gramophone records and so forth, I once made a record with Peter Sellers of a ridiculous song called They're Removing Grandpa's Grave to Build a Sewer. Now what's the use of living like an angel? Like an angel! If when you die, your troubles never cease. Cause some society gink wants a pipeline for a sink. They won't let dear old Grandpa rest in peace. They're removing Grandpa's grave to build a sewer with Peter Sellers, Spike Milligan and an all-star cast. Uh, you were also doing backing groups for singers. Yes. One of my earliest artists that I accompanied was a young singer called Jimmy Young. Really? Yes, who uh, had a big hit with a song called Too Young at that mm -hmm. time. And uh, I did some sessions with Petula Clark and uh, all many of the singers of the day. And uh, it was really a singer who introduced me to George Martin. It was Dick James who was doubling being a singer with being an exploitation manager for the publishing company I was working for at that time. And he got a contract from George Martin to record some songs and said he'd like this young fellow, Ron Goodwin, to be his arranger and conductor. And that was how I first met George Martin, who later gave me a contract to record with Ron Goodwin and his concert orchestra, which yes. was a major step forward for him. And George Martin had also organised all the early Beatles recordings. Ah, uh, yes, that was after all this happened, of course. When I first met George would be around about 1950 or 51, I should think. When were you first commissioned to write a film score? It's amazing, Roy, how good fortune is a, a necessary part of everyone's career, and I've had a very good share of that, really, in my career. Having met George Martin, he had a secretary at that time called Judy Lockhart-Smith, and uh, she's now Mrs. George Martin, of course, but uh, at that time they were just good friends, and... Um, I wanted to write film music, you know, I was desperately interested in doing it, but I didn't know how to go about it. And I discovered one day that uh, Judy's father was actually the chairman of a company called the Film Producers Guild, who yes. made documentary films and advertising films. And she said that her father was looking for a young composer who wouldn't be too expensive to uh, do some music for a documentary and would I like to go along and see him. So that was actually the very first film that I made or wrote the music for, and that was a, a, a documentary about oil refineries, I remember, called The Corriton Achievement. A subject in which you're <laughs> <laughs> deeply interested. A yeah. wallow in it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So documentaries led to second features, and then first features, of course. Yes. Who looks after music? Does the composer work with the producer or director? How does it operate? Usually with the director, if he's still around. I mean, I have worked on a lot of pictures where the director's gone off to make his next epic and uh, he's not available for the music runnings. But normally, the director and the film editor and sometimes the producer, if he's interested, meet and discuss the music and decide where it has to go. Mm -hmm. Probably the most specific director I ever worked with was Alfred Hitchcock, who knew precisely what he wanted 
the type of music that he wanted, where he wanted it, and what he wanted it to do. Which one did you do for him? Uh, it was a film called Frenzy, yes. which was about a man running around London strangling ladies with his necktie. But, of course, the opening of the film, Hitchcock had shot from a helicopter going up the River Thames and panning down to a man addressing a crowd outside Westminster City Hall saying, we've now cleared up all the pollution in the River Thames and the camera pans past the crowd and you see a body floating in the oh, River Thames. Typical Hitchcock, very nice Hitchcock. <laughs> <laughs> and he wanted the music during that opening sequence to be, as he put it, the type of music that you would write for a tourist film about London. I don't want the audience to know anything nasty is going to happen, he said, you see. <laughs> and I think he was right. I didn't at the time, but now I think he was absolutely right. When does he usually start to compose? He sees a rough cut first. Yes, yeah, uh, or they probably send the composer a script a few weeks before they're ready with the rough cut, and then he goes along and sees the rough cut. Then, uh, whilst they're trimming it all up and cleaning it all up and so forth, you go away and think about some themes. Then when they've got the fine cut, then it's the time to go into the studio and run the film one reel at a time and decide where the music's going, what it's supposed to be doing, and... Uh, how long it shall be and so forth. Mm -hmm. Then the music editor gives very detailed cue sheets with all the action on in cumulative timings and uh, it's then up to the composer to decide which of the things in any given scene he thinks need pointing or accenting or whatever.
How many films have you done? It's 59 feature films and about oh, half a dozen documentaries, I should think. Which sort of films do you enjoy? Do you enjoy crime films or comedy films? I seem to have got stuck with war films and comedies. You know, I've done a lot of war films like The Battle of Britain, uh, Where Eagles Dare, 633 Squadron. Uh, lots of action, lots of dots yes, on the page. that's right, yes. I'm longing for somebody to ask me to do a nice romantic film where one bar will last five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have another record. I can't think of a better piece of film music than that written by Miklos Rocha for the film Ben-Hur, and it's the love theme.
Away from the film world, a lot of compositions, a lot of recording. Yes, it's very strange, actually, that since 1970, my career's taken a different turn in, in a way that I wouldn't have expected and without any inkling that it was going to do that. Um, I was asked to do a, a film harmonic concert in 70 by a chap called Sidney Samuelson in aid of the Cinema Technicians Benevolent Fund. And there were four conductors. There was Elmer Bernstein, Henry Mancini, Muir Matheson, and, to my surprise, myself. And uh, from then on, different orchestras have invited me to go along and do concerts of film music or popular music and so forth. And that seems to have become sort of half my working life now. Yeah. So I, I reckon I spend about half my time now writing and the other half travelling about and giving concerts and so yes. forth. And a lot of recording, of course. Yes, not as much now as before. I mean, I don't accompany artists anymore, principally because when I did that, I was actually the musical director for the Parlophone record label. Mm. And I've, when I became busy with films and my own recordings and compositions and so forth, I tended to push that to one side. So I don't uh, accompany artists anymore. I do a, a, a lot of recording with orchestras. I've recently recorded a new suite, the New Zealand suite, with the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra yeah. in their country. And I've got a, an album out at the moment with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra in this country. So, uh, yes, I'm, I'm doing quite a lot of recording. Good. We've got to record number six. Well, I think I would feel the heat rather on this trial. I assume it's a tropical island, is it? Oh, uh, yes, of course uh, it yes, is. Yes. yes, the picturesque one. Yeah. You must have seen one it in many films. films. Yeah. You, you must have written some background <laughs> music for <a> Desert <laughs> Island at some time or another. <laughs> well, in that case, I think I would need to be reminded of a, a jolly good English winter with plenty of ice and snow and stuff about. So I've chosen a record called Midnight Sleigh Ride, the piece was actually written by Prokofiev, but I personally prefer the arrangement by the Salter Finnegan Band. The Sorta Finnegan Band, Midnight Sleigh Ride, based on a little something by Prokofiev. <laughs> you talked about uh, conducting concerts in New Zealand. You do yes. travel the world a deal now, don't you? Yes, and I enjoy that very much, I must say. I go over to Sweden every year and uh, occasionally to Canada, now and then to Australia, every other year to New Zealand. And uh, that's apart from touring all around England as well with uh, most of our major orchestras, and I find that most enjoyable. Any, uh, any favourite stories about um, arriving as a stranger in one of those distant towns and finding yourself in front of a strange orchestra? Not really. I, I think musicians everywhere are extremely professional, but, of course, you do get some funny things happening with audiences. On the last tour that I did in New Zealand, we finished the tour in Auckland, and there was a chap sitting in the, the front row, and this was with the New Zealand Symphony Orchestra, and I was introducing the thing with a few little light-hearted remarks, and this chap was roaring with laughter at everything I said. You know, it was practically a case of good evening, everyone. Ha, 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 from this chap. <laughs> yeah. And after the concert, I was signing autographs outside and he came up with his wife and I said, well, you appear to have enjoyed the concert this evening. And his wife said, well, I didn't really know whether to bring him. She said, he's never been to a concert before. And he said, uh, well, I'm coming again. He said, I've had a marvellous time tonight, you know, and the thought crossed my mind that the next conductor out there is Sir Charles Groves. <laughs> 
And this chap's going to be sitting in the front row waiting for the jokes to start, you know. <laughs> <laughs> You'd better warn Sir Charles. <laughs> number seven well being a west country man i would like to be reminded of the west country of england on this desert island and i can't think of a record that would do that better than bax's tintagel so may we have that one please The opening of Tintagel by Arnold Bax, the London Symphony Orchestra conducted by Sir John Barbie Raleigh. How do you think you'd be as a castaway on this desert island? Could you look after yourself? Well, I would have a go. I'm, I'm not really a very practical person, but uh, I've had a wonderful example. In my house, which is really two cottages converted into a house, uh, we had a wonderful chap called Arthur doing all the building and converting. And Arthur worked on the theory that there's nothing that you can't do. I mean, I remember when we moved in there, the removal men said, oh, I'm sorry, we can't get the bed up those stairs, it's too narrow. So Arthur said, what? He said, hang on. And he rushed out and came in with a huge saw and sawed the bed in half, you see. They took it upstairs and then he put it back together again. So having had the example of Arthur, I, yes. I do believe that nothing is impossible and I'll have a go at it, but of course I wouldn't have his expertise. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've got some ideas. Your last record. Well, I guess I'd like to sort of remember the good old days whilst I was on this island and uh, part of the enjoyment of life, a large part of the enjoyment of life for me is going around and giving the concerts that we do. And an encore that we often play on concerts is a piece called The Peanut Bender. And it's an arrangement that I did, borrowing a lot, shall we say, from the Stan Kenton arrangement. So I think I'd like to hear the original Stan Kenton arrangement of The Peanut Bender. <laughs> Peanut Vendor by the Stan Kenton Orchestra. If you could take just one of the eight discs you played, which would it be? Uh, very difficult, Roy, actually, but I think it would be Tintagel because of its uh, associations with the West Country. And one luxury to take with you, one object of no practical use. 
Well, I've thought about this one a little bit too, and I thought of all sorts of different things, but I think really, if it's possible, could I have a musical instrument of some kind? Yes, of course. Well, having been a brass player and got some inkling of uh, how to manage a brass instrument, I think I should go to the other end of the range from the one that I've actually played in the past, and I think I'll choose the tuba. Well, that's got a lot of brass in it, hasn't it? (laughs) (laughs) And one book, apart from the Bible and the complete works of Shakespeare, which are already provided. Well, the book I've chosen, a very small book, actually. It's one that I carry with me most of the time when I'm on tour or whatever. And it's a little book called The Prophet by a Lebanese author called Khalil Gibran. And uh, it's a book that I find has got a lot of the kind of philosophy that helps me. And it fits into a pocket anyway, and uh, I can usually find something in that book that relates to my current problems or my imagined problems, and uh, I think I'd like to have that one. The Prophet by, give me the author again. Khalil Gibran. You shall have it handsomely bound. Thank you very much for that. Goodbye, everyone.